You, um, you feel good? And remarkably, the answer might actually be yes. That's the goal. You might want to live long, but even more importantly, you want to live well. I'd like to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way first. So uh, say after me, thank you, Morris. Thank you, Morris. Excellent. Saves time later. <laughs> there is a wonderful, exciting, magic time in all our lives, and I'd like to take you back now. Way back. Back further even than the prodigious power of PowerPoint slides can reach. I'd like you to close your eyes for a moment and imagine that it's still today, but you're 13 years old, or 12, or 11, or 10, or 9. Those magic years. If you were lucky, your earlier years were surrounded by caring, loving adults who were only too glad should you ever require some information about how the world works, some opinions about what's fair or unfair, just or unjust? Complete worldviews sometimes would be made available to you by those loving parents and other adults that helped, helped you through your, your first years. But now, now for the first time, you're starting to think for yourselves. Your you're looking at the world truly through your own eyes. And you're seeing things that are leading you to start to make your own judgments about what's fair and unfair, just and unjust. And you're also seeing that the world is such an exciting place. So much potential, so many incredible possibilities for you on your life's journey your happiness. But you're also noticing some things that puzzled you and concern you. Things are a little different to how you imagined they would be as you, as you spent those early years in your nurturing and caring family. You're noticing that some of the most important and visible adults in the world, adults you've developed the sense who have been chosen by the important adults in your life to take care of some of the big tasks of keeping our human enterprise ticking over and progressing happily, some of these adults seem to be behaving in ways that you would not have expected. In fact, they seem to be spending more and more of their time doing things that, if you had done them at home in your early years, would have had you sent to your room, squabbling, bickering, name-calling, boasting, bullying, all those sorts of behaviours. You're also noticing that those adults who steered you so lovingly to where you are now, they seem to be looking increasingly worried, even a little haunted at times, and if you ever ask if anything's wrong, they always say, no, no, it's fine. But you sense that there are things going on in the adult world that, well, they must be terrible things because those adults around you who have, who have shared so much with you through your early childhood, they don't even seem to want to talk about them. So there must be big and terrible things happening out in that world that you are going to have to face yourself eventually because you know that you'll be walking forward into your adult years. And perhaps worst of all, just at the time in your life when for the first time you are starting to evolve your own truths, you're laying the basis of your own moral landscape, you're sensing that out there in the adult world, even the very notion of truth is creating uncertainty. And well, what a terrible time to have to deal with one of the great philosophical dilemmas that any age has ever had to deal with. I've visited as an author for young people more than 2,000 schools in my career, and one of the joys of my job is that I get to spend four or five months each year 
listening to young people and talking with them. And I, in particular, like to listen to them talk about where they see themselves in the world now and where they see themselves in the world in 10 or 15 years' time. And, well, young people are often heard to say things like, why can't people be nicer to each other? Why can't people listen to each other? Why can't people just sit down and talk about things? Why can't people be kinder? And I know these sound naive and perhaps overly innocent to some of your ears. Well, probably not to you, but I know in the general population they sometimes seem very naive, those comments. But I know that what these young people are really saying, and they would very rarely use these particular words, but what they're saying is, we fear that our human conversation is broken. Well, I'm an optimist. I know you are too. You wouldn't be here if you, if you weren't. And I don't think our human conversation is broken. I think it's looking a bit worse for wear. I think it needs a bit of panel beating in places. But I know our human conversation isn't broken because I know that we humans, we have communities who are guardians of our human conversation. I'm a member of such a community, and you are too. And throughout the centuries, the millennia of our human discourse, we in these communities have had special places where our human conversation has flourished and grown and sometimes taken refuge. And we call these places stories. And I'm here this morning to remind you that the young people that we have in our families or that we work with, in another 10 or 15 years, it will be their turn. They will be stepping up, as has every human generation before them, to have their few decades of keeping our show on the road, of advancing our human enterprise, of taking things forward to a point where the next generation, as has always been the case, will take over. And along the way, hopefully, experiencing personal fulfillment and happiness that is all of our birthrights. But they're going to need, as every human generation has, help. But I think, notwithstanding some of the incredible positive um, ideas and examples of how, when we work together, we can achieve incredible things in the face of adversity, and some of these ideas have come from this stage this morning, and, I'm, and I know we're all feeling very inspired and even perhaps a little relieved by them, but notwithstanding that, I think it's still true to say that the young people who are our young people today, as they step forward into adulthood, they're going to be collectively facing the biggest range of challenges, certainly on a global scale, that any human generation has ever faced. And we need to equip them as best we can. And there are many ways to equip them, of course. And I want to remind you that one way we can equip them is to allow as many stories into their lives as possible. And I want to quickly demonstrate what I mean by this. Because stories, of course, have been with us at the center of our human discourse for as long as we've had a human discourse. And I know, as somebody who spent his life writing stories for young people, that busy and distracted adults, that's almost a tautology, isn't it, um, often forget, even if their own ch childhoods were full of a rich and varied diet of reading, they often forget that, um, that children's stories are more than just the means by which we initially learn to functionally read. They are more than 
escapism, entertainment, and all good and, and useful things, but they have much, much more to offer. And there is a paradox at the heart of a story that we really need to be prepared to accept and embrace if we are going to be equipped to understand that it's really worth giving our young people as much time and opportunity and permission to read stuff of their own choosing as possible. I wish I could say that at the heart of every story, its engine, its purpose, its driving force was happiness. But that is not true. At the heart of every story is a problem, is at least one character with at least one problem. And some of you may be feeling slightly doubtful about this. Have a think about the last work of fiction you read, the last movie you saw. I don't know what you've been reading, I don't know what you've been watching. I know for absolute certain that every story you've encountered through your life will have at least one character in it with at least one problem. And I'm going to quickly try and demonstrate why that has to be the case. Imagine, take your nine-year-old self, if you like, into the local library, in your imagination now, and there on the new bookshelf is this amazing book. It's the happiest looking book you've ever seen. It's called The Happiest Girl in the World. You pick it up, look at the blurb on the back, and the publishers tell us it's a story of a girl who has no problems, none. Not now, not in the past, not in the future. Guaranteed, they say, problem-free story. Well, this is exactly what we'd like, isn't it? After a busy day out in the world, full of those problems that are an inescapable part of our human existence. Put our feet up, read about some happiness. And I'll leave it up to you to imagine what the happiest girl in the world would be doing on a typical Tuesday morning in her life, but, well, here she is on page one. We can all know for certain she's, she's happy. And oh yes, she is, because only a problem can stop her being happy. Page two, happy. Page three, happy. Page four. Ooh, it's a pretty thick book, actually. Wow, 470 pages. Let's stick our necks out and make a prediction as to exactly how she'll be feeling on page 470. Yes, you've got it, happy. Anybody feeling keen to read the remaining 467 pages when we already know? No, because this is part of the paradox. In our lives, we would love to get rid of as many problems as possible. What a gift for those we love. Happy birthday, darling. As of today, you will have a life devoid of problems. It's not going to happen, I'm sorry. have to stick to the chocolates. Because, um, because there has never been a human on the planet who has had a life devoid of problems. And so, in our stories, we know that to reflect aspects of our human truth, there's got to be problems, but there's a technical reason as well. Because if a story has absolutely no problems, it can only have one possible ending, happy, happy, happy. And for us readers, that means only one ending, boring, boring, boring. We know it on page one. As Soon as there's a problem, and it can be anything, we're in the park, our young happy character's in the park with her friends having a typically happy morning, and things are just great. Right up until, oh, this is fantastic. It turns out the publishers don't always tell the truth in their blurbs on the back of books. And whoa, halfway down page five, whoosh, a huge rock whistles past our character's head. She's a little surprised, looks off in the distance, through the trees, can't see anybody. Thinks to herself, hmm, some clown over there has just chucked a rock at somebody else. Pathetic aim, completely missed, almost hit me. Didn't, that was lucky carries on having a very happy morning with her friends. But for only a few seconds, because then whoosh, another rock, bigger than the first, hurtles past her head. This time so close it grazes her eyebrow. Bits of her eyebrow go tinkling down to the lawn at her feet. And now our character, our happiest girl in the world, is thinking a thought she's never thought before. Hang on, she thinks, two rocks, less than 10 seconds, second one closer than the first. Someone's chucking rocks at me. And that's when she realizes she has a problem, and we, her readers, yes, we say, thank you, universe. This is what we were hoping for. 
we're not cruel, are we? We're not kind, unkind, but we know that without a problem, there will simply never be anything unexpected, exciting, thrilling, none of that stuff. So now there's a problem. And what do we have to thank for this story even existing? The problem. Thank you, problem, we say. And the problem says, that's OK. In fact, I've got more gifts for you. <laughs> because once a character realizes they've got a problem, here's what they will never do. Whoa, somebody is chucking rocks at me. Here comes the third one. It's big. It's fast. It's hurtling straight towards my head. Oh, well. Bang. That is not <laughs> what characters do. What a character will always do is act. They will do anything in their power to solve or, s or escape or survive that problem. Here comes the third rock. Luckily, our happiest girl in the world, part of her happy life is her love of soccer. She's a great goalkeeper. She can dive three times her own body length out of the path of the rock, almost. It smashes into her right foot, breaks three toes, mangles the ligaments. She's going to need surgery, so much surgery. And this, this is a problem growing out of the problem because she was going to be keeping goal for us at the next Soccer World Cup finals and <laughs> It was our, oh, our best chance ever to wrest that trophy away from those big-headed nations in the Northern Hemisphere. But now, another problem. Another gift that, um, uh, that problems give us is that there's not just one thing a character can do to solve a problem. There's an infinite number of things. Forget soccer. Doesn't really like soccer in a happy sort of way. She, um, what she does love is surviving. Here comes the third rock. It's fast. She's got a microsecond to think of a problem-solving strategy and to put it into action, and she doesn't hesitate. Thinks creatively, has an idea, and acts. Grabs a friend, pulls the friend in front of her, <laughs> lets the friend take the rock. <laughs> and a couple of moments later, as she looks down at the motionless, bleeding body of her, <laughs> of her, her ex-best friend, The problem gives us perhaps the greatest gift of all, because that is the moment that she starts to feel things, to have emotions, that universal connecting component of stories that allows us to connect with any character and any author, no matter how distant we are from them in all sorts of ways. And what would she be feeling? Well, she'd be feeling many different things. She'd be feeling sad, sad. Oh. I'm being torn apart by sadness now because I know every day of my life I will be, I'll, I will just, I'll never get this image out of my head of my poor ex-best friend lying there bleeding, particularly when I'm eating tomato sauce. Grief, ah, oh. ah, guilt. How could I have done that? How could I have done that when if I'd given it just another microsecond thought, I could so easily have chosen my second best friend and used her instead, I'd still have a best friend. So it is a paradox, isn't it? Because in stories, problems are our friends, and we owe them a lot. And there's a real significance to this, because the way stories equip our young people to face any problems that the, story, that the future can throw at them. Well, here's a typical journey of a young protagonist in a story for young people. A young protagonist is facing a problem bigger than they've ever faced before, too big to ignore or blame on somebody else. They're going to have to do, develop a lot of research skills, new information needed to understand the nature of the problem. Then they're going to have to make a tough and honest decision as to whether they think they can solve or survive this problem on their own. Are they going to need help? They probably, they, they probably are. They're going to need to form an alliance, perhaps with individuals that would not be the sort of people that they would want to be friends with, a bit weird, a bit different. New interpersonal skills, developing the capacity for empathy. They may even need to put themselves in their enemy's shoes and try and think like that enemy. Even more empathy. They're going to need to develop problem-solving strategies, possibly for the first time in their life, and they're going to need to use all these personal resources to make it the best problem-solving strategy they can, and they'll put it into action, and it definitely, definitely will not work, because they're a character in a long-form fiction, and it's only page 42, and their author, their friend, and their counselor, and their, and, and their companion, that author is contracted to write at least 240 pages. 
And so they're going to fail the first time they try that problem-solving strategy, and they're going to need another one and another one to get us all the way to 250 pages. So they are going to develop resilience. And when young people go on that um, story journey with their book in hand, hundreds, hopefully thousands of times through their childhood, they are internalizing all those key attributes, those strengths, those developmental points. And then there's only one thing further they need. They need to be able to talk about, as they always will, when a story has taken them beyond the limits of their previous experience, they want to have conversations. And this is, again, where you come in, where we all come in. Because those conversations, I have come to believe, are as important as the books. They are an absolutely indispensable part of the stories themselves. Those conversations, fueled by stories, will carry our young people into the future to do the huge tasks that await them. Tasks that if we can equip them as enough, they will be tasks that not only help keep our human enterprise on track, ticking along, they will also be tasks that bring to our young people in their adult forms a lot of happiness. Thank you.